Um, another piece of news, and so so this week we're segueing into uh, talking about the Cyblogs pod, uh, Cyblogs rather posts <laughs> that we found interesting over the week because some of them do intersect nicely with some of the big news. Now, one of the big pieces of news out this week was, uh, I think it came out on Friday, yes, um, people talking about the possible discovery that neutrinos may, may possibly, maybe just travel faster than light. Um, what happened is some scientists uh, playing with neutrinos, about 15,000 of them over the last three years, have <clears throat> got results which they are finding extremely disturbing, mostly. <laughs> and it's that their results suggest that these neutrinos are traveling faster than light, which, according to our current models of physics, is not actually possible <laughs> at all. And and so there's a lot of head-scratching. And, and they have come out, and I think it's absolutely wonderful, they've come out and said, look, please help us. Help us verify these. Help us check over all our results. Help us figure out whether this is true or not. Because if it is true, of course, um, it, there's going to be some fundamental rewriting of our understanding of physics here. Of course, there are other results. For example, um, scientists have measured the speed of neutrinos arriving from uh, um, supernovas, and those were consistent with, uh, well, with not being faster than light. So lots and lots and lots of confusion. But it's it's generated some very funny jokes. It's generated a lot of banter and wittering about it. And um, I've got to say, neutrinos, they are just so interesting. They're definitely my favorite of the subatomic particles. Uh, it's always worth just having a look at them and seeing what they're up to now because they're really, really difficult to um, measure, superbly difficult to measure. So it's always interesting when we have some data around them. We'll just have to see how this goes on. So um, there's a post on Cyblogs about it, just explaining some of the background and sort of what's going on and also some of the theories about what might be happening. Um, it may be errors. It may be faster than light. It may be hyperspace. God knows. Um, there are links in there to, to articles. Um, there are CERN held a webcast on Friday about it as well, um, where the scientists actually spoke and sort of, if nothing else, named all the stuff that they'd gone through to try and check that they haven't made some obvious error, like, I don't know, not carrying the one. <laughs> yeah, um, when you do that. Yeah, it, it sucks. So really, really interesting. Um, you can also read the paper on archive.org, and I'd suggest you do this. This kind of stuff is always fun, and um, it's physics. We love it. But we do also have to say that that has not been published in a peer-reviewed journal it yet. It's not. published on a preprint archive. Yeah. And while, because it's at CERN, you assume it's of the highest standard of scientific quality, hmm. it hasn't been through all the rigorous usual scientific checks. So don't get too excited about yeah. uh, about it until someone like Science or Nature publishes it. And even then, it'll still have to be replicated a number of times by other groups before we can even start considering precisely um, the implications of what that result means. Yeah. But for the meantime, we can still poke fun. It's so cool. <laughs> yeah. And and just so wonderful to see that, that the media has been actually quite good also in reporting the scientists not going, we have fundamentally changed physics, but instead going, uh... There's something really weird here. We need to get this verified. Yeah, it's a beautiful example, actually, of the process working and everyone, I think, being quite responsible about saying we don't know what's going on. We need to check this a lot more before we get excited. <laughs> Nonetheless, it's quite cool. <laughs> At the same time going, we may have broken time. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, because that's, that's, um, uh, that's one of the major uh, things about this is that it breaks the cause and effect sort of arrow of time physics, which we're used to, and, and the fact that effects tend to come after causes. So, yeah, great jokes. Go and have a look at the wittering. <laughs> the next thing is a birthday celebration um, from uh, Cyblog, uh, Cyblogger Bridget Gallagher, mm -hmm. uh, who is our resident archaeologist and archaeological expert. And this year, uh, on sorry, the 19th of September, it's an international talk like a pirate day, it is also 20 years after the mummified remains of a man nicknamed Otzi was discovered by hikers in the Italian Alps, and he's believed to have lived about 5,000 years ago. What makes him remarkable is the condition that he was discovered in. So you get mummies in all sorts of different conditions. Yep. Most of them are in pretty poor conditions because the person is dead. Uh, a number of times they've been through some kind of a burial process. Someone's not pretty, on them. <laughs> yeah, and they're pretty dried out. But poor old Otzi, after he died, he got almost instantaneously frozen. So all of his skin cells, all of his hmm. stuff is Ill, or still hydrated. So that means that um, things like DNA and other other forensic science uh, techniques are much, much more successful. So we found out all sorts of things about him. Interestingly enough, we think he died from uh, an arrow wound to his mm. left shoulder, oh. uh, even though he also had quite uh, badly decayed, uh, sorry, quite badly 
um, damaged joints. It was just uh, an age thing. He was about Ooh. 45, they think, when he died. He had coal, uh, sorry, he had carbon deposits in his lungs, and they believe that this is because of a consistent use of fire. He has tattoos at the points on his joints, <laughs> where he would have had joint pain and joint problems. His, his mitochondrial DNA that we mentioned before uh, says he's from European origin. He was found with a whole bunch of tools and clothes, a first aid kit, all sorts of other things, wow. and there's actually an exhibition. He's touring around Europe at the moment with a very, very cool website. So for the details, have a look at Bridget's blog. Um, for the rest of it, there's a number of links out there, but very, very interesting, and that was a really, really cool discovery. Indeed. Um, yeah, and the uh, final one is, is, again, a quick one. Michael Edmonds of Molecular Matters is going through a, a poetic phase, I guess we could call it. He's having fun writing science poetry. Um, there are a couple of recent ones. The most recent one, which is out, I think, today, uh, is called Time for a New Scientific Revolution. Um, and he also put out one yesterday called Wolf in Sheep's Clothing, which is about alternative medicine. So go and have a look. I've got to say, he's pretty good. Um, <laughs> and is apparently from the back chatter amongst the uh, Cyborgs bloggers, really just having quite a lot of fun. So, that's cool. The yeah, excellent poetry. And one last thing from me, our blogger uh, from Open Parachute, Ken Parrott, posted a post this week called Where Have We Been? And it's just a repost of a wonderful, wonderful diagram mm. of where all of humankind's satellites have been since they started leaving Earth orbit with Sputnik in the 1950s. Yeah. And, of course, they've gone to the moon, they've gone to Mars, Saturn, Jupiter, edge of the solar system, sun, all sorts. Really, really cool graphic which shows how many and where they've been and quite importantly, where they're going. Absolutely. Um, I can't remember. What's the name of the satellite that's still beetling out of the um, solar system busily? Voyager 1 is pushing yes. it at the moment, and Voyager uh, 2 is coming up. Um, one of them, I can't remember whether it's Voyager 1 or Voyager 2. Uh, let me have a look here quickly. Um, has a Twitter stream, uh, uh, which I follow. Yeah, it's Voyager 2. Two, I believe. I think. Yes, it is Voyager 2. There you go. So uh, it's really quite cool. Every now and then it sort of sends in a little, uh, a little tweet saying where it is and how many light seconds it is away from Earth and stuff. It's just fantastic. I love the fact that Voyager's Twitter enabled. I'm not sure exactly how they've managed it, but... <laughs> Worthwhile he following. Hasn't, he hasn't devolved into lolcats grammar yet as well. <laughs> <laughs> I can has passed the helio sheet. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be fantastic. All right, on to the uh, events of the week. This is a, a, an action-packed week, science-wise, um, particularly from Tuesday through about Friday. So first we've got, uh, this is on Tuesday, Future Proof, Earth, Straw, and More in the 21st Century. It's in Auckland. Um, so it's looking at sort of earth and straw bale and, and these al what they call alternative or natural building materials. Um, and they're looking at their history, their properties, current practice, new developments, um, and the role that these materials could have in providing sort of self-sufficient and energy lean housing stock. So it's a mixture of sort of the natural stuff, the sustainable stuff, and architectural stuff. And I, I, with a personal uh, interest in green and sustainable architecture and having helped build a straw bale house, I've got to say, straw's pretty cool. So it would be interesting to see what comes out of this. Also on Tuesday night, the Carter Observatory in Wellington is continuing their um, foreign navigation using the Star Stories series. Uh, this week it's European navigation, mm. and Dr. Julie Titsov will be talking about the history of Western navigation. So that's going to be extremely cool. Well, I'll probably kick off about 6 o'clock or so. Have a look at the Carter website for more details. Definitely. Um, on Wednesday there are two events. The first is is What's Shaping the Media in 2011. That's at the Turnbull House. And this is uh, journalists from print, radio, online, and television discussing how and why they report on science, what they and their editors are looking for in a science story, and what you need to know before you pitch a story or when the media calls. If one is interested in science communication, that would definitely be useful to get along to. Um, as well, there's uh, a talk uh, called It's Our Fault by Russ Fendison, and it's going to be in Hamilton. So this week it's nice to see a good spread all over the country of stuff. Um, um, and it's talking about risk and analysis. So uh, the blurb here says, the Christchurch earthquakes have sparked fresh concern about the likelihood of a large quake in Wellington. Uh, Russ Van Deesen is from GNS Science, and he's going to discuss this topic as part of a nationwide lecture series. He's going to look at research surrounding Wellington's earthquake risk, the impacts that earthquakes can have on our nation, and the importance of our resilience. So let's hope that he's not misquoted by any government officials. Fingers crossed, but I won't. I won't <laughs> hold my breath there. Yeah. Thursday is also another big day. So um, on Thursday evening, uh, um, starting at five thirty p.m., there's a Science Communicators Association of New Zealand discussion. Uh, the panel will include Dr. Jilly Evans and Dr. Bruce Campbell and Vincent Herringer. Um, 
And where is that going to be? Um, that The venue of that, sorry, is still to be confirmed. It's yeah. going to be up in Auckland, yeah. and it's going to be a discussion with a whole bunch of really, really good science communicators. So mm. if you're up in Auckland, make an effort and go along for that. Yeah. Down here in Wellington on Thursday night, out at uh, Holy Bagels in Lower Hutt, <laughs> Cafe Scientifique is featuring a fantastic speaker. And I have to say that because this week my uh, PhD supervisor is actually presenting. He's presenting on the physics of rugby uh, ah. as part and parcel of the... Um, aforementioned large sporting event that's going on at the moment. <laughs> Jeff is a wonderful physicist and he's also an avid rugby fan so he's going to make it short and engaging. If you're free on Thursday night ta- head out to um, Holy Bagels in Lower Hutt. Uh, the, only, the only thing I think of when I think about the physics of rugby is, is the terror of having about a ton or more of pure muscle running at one at top speed. I just I can feel my bones cracking. <laughs> but yes. <clears throat> so uh, I think that wraps it up for us for this week. As always, check out uh, the blog, cyblogs.co.nz forward slash TOSP, T-O-S-P, uh, where all of the links that we've mentioned will be up. Um, we're also, well, you might have... Uh, huh. I apologize there. You may even be able to pull it into sort of podcatchers and things like that. We are working uh, on the ability to do that. Um, a thank you to the Science Media Center, as always, for the use of their gear and to Vic for the use of their space. And to Rian Shian for letting us use his music as the wonderful intro and outro themes. Also take a look at our other interesting things. Indeed. Oh, yes, we did. The other interesting things, Pearl, awesome, and there will be links. And there's so much this week was really, really cool. So, yeah, we'll sign off. Um, Please do get in contact with us if you'd like to talk with us at all. And otherwise, enjoy your week. See you next time.